that has claimed the promise of the Holy Spirit. And when you wonder, well, what will the Holy Spirit look like in me? Just take a fresh look at Jesus and imagine Jesus living out his will and his life in you and that you become like him. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. It allows us to live like Jesus. Is that your goal? Amen. Praise the Lord. When we fall short, we go to Jesus and say, Lord, I took my eyes off of you. I stumbled and fell. And it may mean that you have to go to your brother, your sister, your wife, your friend, and say, you know what? I am really sorry. I took my eyes off of Jesus and I started to sink and you became the collateral damage. But forgive me. And we get back on our feet. We hug and we move forward, right? We don't harbor hard feelings. We don't harbor animosity. We realize that we're human beings and if our eyes aren't fixed on Jesus, we will fail. But God, there's forgiveness from Jesus and there's forgiveness from each other. And that is a joy. And that is the experience that the disciples experienced. Even though Paul had a little bit of an issue with John Mark, we read later, John Mark was profitable. So say the Holy Spirit worked even in those spirit-filled people to bring about a transformation in them. They were growing in grace, just like all the rest of us have to grow in grace. I was talking to Dave this week about the Sabbath school lesson, and we were talking about Romans chapter 7 and, verse, and chapter 8. And it wasn't that Paul was not converted. I don't like the idea that Paul was, this is before his conversion in 7, now he's converted in 8. No. 8 is, is just really where he really began to uh, the process of sanctification. He realized his desperate need, and then the Holy Spirit began a special work of sanctification. He came to that understanding. And that's what David said, and I, I thought it was really good. Is that clear? Romans 8 is just the continued converted man learning and growing in Christ, walking, learning to walk in the Spirit, which was so powerful. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit, your personal presence in our life. Not a strange thing floating around, but you personally able to come and dwell in us through your Spirit. Your Father sent the Spirit, you send the Spirit, and the Spirit comes to, in, 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 to empower us to, to put Jesus to live so that we can live out as young men, as young women, as older uh, men and women, as elderly men and women, all of us, by your grace, are able to live out the values and the principles and the spirit of Jesus. So thank you, Lord, that you made us in your image. Male and female made us them. And so that we are made in your image and you are, your desire, your greatest desire is to return us to your image. So guide our, our conversation this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I sort of think sometimes because there's so many he's in the Bible that women may feel left out. But you've got to remember that we were made in his image. Male and female made he them. We are all made in God's image. We're, and, 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 and male and female all can reflect God's image, God's character, God's will, and God's purpose. The indwelling spirit. And I'm going to just mention that Ron Clouset, uh, is a, uh, he was a dean of uh, theology at, at Southern, but uh, he's gone on to do various different things. And uh, I gained a lot of my insights and understanding, and I, I have to give credit to him uh, on the Holy Spirit from his books and material he's written. He's very, he's got a really keen understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, so I really appreciate Ron Clousset. Um So the indwelling of the Spirit is the indwelling of Jesus. It's Jesus living in us. What a, how exciting. This is not a theory. It's not a philosophy of life. It's a living Jesus living in his people. That's exciting. So when this happens, it is inevitable to reveal to the world the Christ within. So did not Paul say that those who lack the Spirit 
lack Christ himself. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 to 11. Romans 8, verses 9 to 11, which was our Sabbath school study this week. Very exciting. Romans, the book of Romans, which really the Protestant Reformation came into existence because of the book of Romans. Uh, that is the, the just shall live by faith. Praise the Lord. Not by sight and not by works, but by faith. Um, so in verse 9, we read, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And if any man have not the Spirit of who? Christ. He is none of his. Unless the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, the Spirit of Christ is in us, we aren't his. We can name the name, but we're not his without the Spirit living in us. When the Holy Spirit's living in us, he convicts us of sin, of righteousness, points us to Jesus, the righteous one, and prepares us for the judgment. And then we read on, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. What body? What's he talking about? What body is this? The, the, the body, the carnal nature, the old sinful carnal nature is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, that raised, uh, dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. So we go from death, dead and trespasses and sin, and we move into life and life eternal. That's an amazing transition that God uh, works, this miracle, and that's what the Christian faith is all about. Human beings, broken condition, every world religion recognizes our broken condition, but the good news is that, and there, and there is no other savior, Buddha did not offer to be a savior. Muhammad never offered to be a savior. They gave a philosophy, and if you will follow these things and do this and this and this, then you'll be saved. You will enter into nirvana, you'll enter into, uh, somehow you'll earn your way into eternity. Jesus is the only one who said you, and the Bible makes it very clear, we can't go forward. There's only one hope for humanity, and that is Jesus and all that he did in the plan of salvation. So Christ-like in mission. So we, we talked about the, the two elements of the work of the Holy Spirit. One was to give us power to witness, remember? And now, uh, and, and, or sorry, well, well, power to witness, well, power to uh, have a Christ-like witness. And then a Christ-like mission. So Christ's mission becomes our mission when Christ lives in us. So it is through the spirit that, that Christ within transforms us into his image. And through the indwelling spirit, Christ's church will impact the world for God. A Christ-like character leads to a Christ-like mission. So a Christ-like character leads to a Christ-like mission. To prepare the world for what? For Christ's coming. He wants to prepare the world because he's coming soon. And he's coming for his children. He's going to reap, he's going to harvest his children. There's going to be, at the harvest, there, is, there are two things in a harvest. There's that which you're harvesting, which is, let's say it's a corn. You have the corn or wheat. So you have the wheat and you have the Chaff, you have that, what's, so there's gonna, we're either wheat or we're chaff. Jesus makes us wheat. And so Jesus in us puts the same burden in us uh, as Jesus had. So if we haven't got a burden to save, to bring others to Christ, then we don't really have Jesus in our heart. If we have no desire to speak for Jesus, if we always have an excuse, I can't talk. Now, Moses tried the excuse, path, and God said, I'll send you Aaron. So if you can't witness yourself, then find someone to witness with you. And Jesus said he sent people out how? Two by two. Two by two. But if you have no desire 
to witness that I have to say, Jesus is not dwelling in you. Or he is, but he hasn't activated your desire yet. But if you will stay focusing on Jesus long enough, he will, in you, put a desire to share his love with others. You cannot not have a burden for souls if Christ is living in you. How on earth? Because if it's Jesus, what did, did Jesus have a burden for souls? Was it his love that sent him on the mission? And if Jesus is living in us, he will put the same love in us for others as he had. And we will sacrifice everything for the saving of a soul, of an individual, of someone, our family members, our friends, our neighbors, and our enemies. And so unfortunately, the insignificant impact made in the world by many Christians today is a testimony of the Spirit wanting. Our desperate need for the Holy Spirit, the living Jesus in our hearts, is the, deep, is the, is the need of the church. One person, his name is Carl Bates, in his book, I Believe in the Church, said this. He said, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of our midst, about, and this was his estimate, 95% of what we are doing in our churches would go on, and we would not even know the difference. That's his estimation. In other words, much of what we do is not led by the Spirit, is what he's saying. And we don't want that to be, we don't want to be in that category. We want everything we do to be spirit-led so that we will see the fruit of our labors. That was not so in the New Testament church. Peter, Peter's no-hold-barred sermon on the day of Pentecost uh, led to about 3,000 people being con uh, under conviction and becoming part of the church. And on the second apostolic sermon that Peter gave in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, do you remember how many came in the second time? 5,000 people responded to his message, to his preaching. 5,000 people under the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the, it, was just, it was Pentecost, it just the power had come down. And he spoke with power, and it's very interesting to read that. Signs and wonders accompanied the believers. Multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number in Acts chapter 5, verse 14. Uh, let's read that. Acts 5, verse 14, uh, 12 to 15. We'll read 12 to 15. Acts chapter 5. Just amazing what God was doing under the power of the Holy Spirit in the early church. Is that just sort of good reading, or is God trying to stimulate in us a desire to have the same experience in the last days, just before Christ comes? What do you think? God wants us, that was called the early rain. And in the last days, God is going to pour out the latter rain. So in uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse 12 to 15, and by the hands of the apostles, were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And the, and, and, the, and the rest durth no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And the believers were more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women, multitudes were added to God's church as, as, as the preaching the gospel under the power of the Holy Spirit, inasmuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches uh, that all at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. What were they hoping for if the shadow would go over them? Healing, and, it's, and it happened. And sometimes it talks in other places they would bring handkerchiefs. I think Paul's, they would bring up handkerchief and if somehow or another, they would take that handkerchief back from the presence of Paul or Peter, and they, people would get well. You know, it's amazing. It sounds like some of these evangelists on TV, <laughs> you know, offering the same. But uh, it's amazing what was, now there's false revivals and there's true revivals. We want to be part of the true revival, correct? We're going to be talking about that later today in the afternoon. Stay for 2.30. Make this the day you stay a little later. 30 years of the Spirit-led ministry by the New Testament. Oh, sorry, I want to just finish reading that. Um, uh, in, in verse 2, verse uh, 15 as much. 
Yeah, that's right, I, I stopped there. Okay, um, so 30 years of spirit-led ministry by the New Testament church made Paul maintain that the gospel had been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, Colossians chapter 123. So at the general conference session, a few years ago, in fact, it was back in 1990, and that is when, uh, in, in Indianapolis, Elder Carl Curry told a powerful story of, uh, of a Chinese gentleman, a uh, Chinese deacon, whose name was, uh, was Goa Hung Si, uh, who could neither read nor write, and who, having a poor memory, could not share with others the Bible as read to him. So he couldn't read, he could not write, and he could not remember. Yet he had a great burden to share the truth. Desperately, one Sabbath day, he lay prostrate on the floor of his humble home, and he begged God for power to witness. This was a very sincere Chinese deacon laying on the floor of his very humble home, crying out to God for power to witness. He determined not to rise until the Lord heard his plea. He was very sincere. He wasn't playing religion. This man was really sincere. No reason why we can't be just as sincere as him. No reason. Suddenly heard a voice telling him, read Psalm 62. As he obeyed, he actually read Psalm 62, a man who couldn't read. Some of the verses in Psalm 62, 1 and 2 say, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He is only, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And in verse 5 and 6, my soul waiteth upon only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And then in verse 12, also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his works. So as he read this through the whole from verses 1 to verse 12, he was so excited that he ran to tell the elder of the village where he lived and proceeded to repeat the psalm by memory having only read it once so now he can read now he can remember this powerful anointing of the spirit was the answer to his heartfelt plea and the following year he led 180 people to Christ and baptism into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 180. Because of a sincere prayer. Do not limit God. Just as in Jane's story, that family saw the circumstances. The doctors said, cut his legs off. They saw his legs healed by faith. And he got the vision too. And he was able to run and not be weary. Praise the Lord. What can we do under the power of the Holy Spirit? We, can't, we have to stop limiting God. We really, truly do. I'm talking to myself. I've got to stop limiting what God can do. We need to be in the Word. We need to believe every promise. We need to act on every promise. And we need to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that we can be all that God has called us to be. We know that the power of the Spirit in the last days will exceed the experience in the early church. In the Great Controversy, page 661, we read, and then also from Colossians, uh, that's, from, that's from Great Controversy, and then from Colossians we read, a great work of the gospel is not to, the, the great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. So the last preaching of the word around the world will not, will not end 
with less power than it began. It will have more power. More power. And then we read in the prophecy of Joel chapter 2, receiveth a partial fulfillment in the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost from the faith I live by. But, I will, but it will reach a full accomplishment in the manifestation of divine grace which will attend the closing work of the gospel. Without this new life, the church will not see Jesus face to face and the world will not be ready for his return. We need this new life. There's an amazing story uh, told about a little boy and it was a, it was a frosty morning it was an old farmhouse, and there was a little boy, and he tugged at his grandfather's sleeve as he stomped on the frozen puddles and giggled with delight. If you've lived up north, and you know how you get a little thin layer of ice on a puddle, and it's fun to play with that, stomping on it. You always get splattered a little bit because there's some water underneath that ice. So this little boy was playing, and as they reached the barn, the grandfather reached his arm into a large rain bucket, a rain barrel, and beneath the eave, and he pulled out a glistening, gleaming sheet of ice. Can you imagine that? Big sheet of ice. And the little boy was looking at that, and he was so amazed how pretty it was. It's like a window, right? Not a clear window, but it was a fun window. And so he was playing with that as his grandfather went in to start milking the cows. And as he uh, was playing with it, all of a sudden, it slipped out of his hand and smashed into hundreds of little pieces. And he really, really wanted to play with that more. And uh, so he thought there was probably some more ice uh, in the bottom of the barrel. So he leaned over into the barrel, and as he was reaching down, before he could even shout for help, he went right down into the barrel. And his arms were, it was narrow enough that his arms were locked in like that, so he couldn't get out. And it was about that time, and actually in a few moments, in like a minute or so, he blanked out completely. So he lost consciousness. And, but it was at that time that the milk truck came uh, to collect the milk from the farm. And the driver was impressed that he needed to go around the back of the barn, not go to, you know, to the milking area to pick the milk up, but to go around the back of the barn. And as he went around the back of the barn, he saw the barrel and he saw this little boy's leg sticking out of the barrel. And, uh, and that little boy was lifeless. And so he quickly, he called to the grandfather and he pulled him out and he started doing respiration, you know, he blew, started blowing, you know, artificial respiration. Remember the kind mouth to mouth, which they used to do, we don't do that as much anymore. Uh, but anyway, he was giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth respiration. And with, uh, after a few minutes of doing that, all of a sudden the little boy started to cough because there was water in his lungs. And a little boy came back to life. Praise the Lord. You know, that is really the condition of the church. We need the breath of the Holy Spirit. We need the breath of the Holy Spirit to give, breathe life into us. It's like, I, I always think of this Adventist church. I think of us, uh, not only our local church, but I think of the worldwide church. Everything is in place. The mechanism in place, the churches are in place. The, the all, we have all the resources. We've got all the tools. We've got the internet. We've got the satellites. We've got everything in place. But what we need is a fresh infilling of the Spirit. We need that breath that will bring life back to us. And it can only be gotten by asking for it because God said he's willing to give it, but we have to ask. And we have to ask with sincerity, lying prostate on the floor. Can you imagine that dear Chinese gentleman lying prostate on the floor, laying on the floor and calling for God to give him power to witness. And he wasn't going to get up until the power came. And when he got up, God, well, he told him what to do and he got up and did it. And he went and did it by faith. Don't you think that we can do the same. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we need more than ever before a fresh indwelling of your Spirit. Lord, we've heard the words, we've said the words, we've talked about the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. But Lord, there, there needs to be a claiming of the Holy Spirit from our, our own lives. 
Number one, to transform our characters into the likeness of Jesus, and then to empower us to witness to the world and to demonstrate your love so that everyone will know that you, that you came on a mission of love, that you have saved them, and that they too can be part of your eternal family. Lord, may not one of us here miss that, uh, receiving that beautiful gift of eternal life, and may we be filled with your spirit so that we can share that wonderful gift, live that gift, and then share it with others. Thank you, dear Lord, for each one that's here this morning. And Lord, bless each one of us. May this become a reality for us. May you put a passion in our heart like you did that dear Chinese gentleman wanting to have the, the, the Holy Spirit, wanting to have power to witness. And Lord, because we can make a difference, as he made a difference, we can make a difference. Thank you, dear Lord, for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.